Hello, and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2017 webinar series, Empowering Citizens Through Technology to Reduce Marine Plastic Pollution. My name is Rob Goodyear. I'm the Managing News Editor at E4C, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we get rolling, I'd like to thank the E4C webinar series team. They host informative presentations on a monthly basis, and you can find information on upcoming webinars, as well as archived videos of past presentations on the E4C webinars webpage, as well as our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Please use the email address on this slide to send the team your questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers. That address is webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists. We are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. The more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more, please see our website. It's www.engineeringforchange.org to learn more and sign up. Our next webinar is next month on May 17th. It is called Product, Product Design Simulation and Modeling with Fusion 360. It will be presented by Andre Mooring at, uh, at Autodesk, Sustainable Simulation Lead at Autodesk. Please see the E4C Professional Development page for more information and registration details. And if you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinars directly. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the webinar software by telling us where you are in the world. In the chat window, which is located in the bottom right of your screen, please type your location and, if you'd like, where you are from. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon in the top right corner. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar. And if you have technical questions, just send a private chat to Engineering for Change admin. So go ahead and give that a try, and let's see where some of you are calling in from. Okay, great, thank you. Some of them are coming in right now. I see we have people in Boulder, Colorado, representing the Northern Mariana Islands. Thank you for joining us. Savannah, Georgia, beautiful town. Minnesota, Newburgh, Indiana, Slovenia, Switzerland. Great. And we also have a caller saying that uh, they can't hear audio. Um, I have some advice for you. So let's see here. Um, you can try turning it off and turning it back on again. Um, that's the tried and true advice uh, for computers, and it applies to these webinars also. If you have audio or visual trouble, try hitting stop and then start. And you may also try opening WebEx in a different browser. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. And if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon in the top right corner. Uh, if you weren't aware, E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request yours, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. You can see that. Uh, URL right here on this slide. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. 
testingourwaters.net empowers citizen scientists to track and prevent marine plastic pollution by designing and distributing easy-to-build, inexpensive, do-it-yourself trawls. Hang these trawls off of a bridge, boat, or shoreline and collect plastic trash in the water. You can use your haul to help identify where the trash is coming from. In this webinar, Barrett Rock will introduce the project and share trawl designs and techniques for taking action to protect our oceans. Barrett is a designer and educator dedicated to sustainable products, practice, and services. He's the co-founder of the award-winning sustainable to restorative design firm Grow Design, creator of the LA Green Drinks Network, and former executive director of Sustainable Works. He now teaches courses in sustainable design at Parsons, the new school in New York City, while independently designing sustainable solutions. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. I'm going to get started here. It hopefully will start to share Keynote, and it looks like it is. Um, if you can just give me a heads up and make sure I'm seeing everything. Um, are, are you guys seeing this full screen now, I hope? I'm going to uh, talk uh, for – thanks, Rob. Um, for joining us, I, or for inviting us, rather. Um, you mentioned the, the next webinar, the Fusion 360 webinar. The products that uh, we have designed for this project have all been done on Fusion 360. And so I, I teach uh, CAD modeling, and so I'll, um, I'll send my, uh, my students to that webinar as well. It's, uh, it's a great program. It's incredibly inexpensive, if not free if you're a student or educator, and um, it's one of the reasons we chose it for this project. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today, uh, uh, first I'm going to give you context about our, our project, and that will involve making sure you understand what marine plastic pollution is. I'm going to give you a little project history, and then we'll get into the project itself and make sure that you come away feeling like uh, you know how to build an inexpensive trawl. Um, you know how easy it is. Um, you'll understand the different environments in which to trawl. Um, we'll show you how you can document your findings and what we've been doing. Um, and then I'll show you uh, ideas for designing your own trawls. <clears throat> at the end, we'll look at um, our uh, next closing thoughts and, and next steps for um, this project, and I want to be sure and leave time for, for Q&A at the end. So just to make sure we're all on uh, the same page, I want to start by uh, uh, going into the marine plastic pollution problem. So you may have heard uh, this referred to as uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch when this first became um, part of our public consciousness. This is what it was referred to. So it's not totally accurate. Um, the, the next um, description given was it was a garbage island. And while there are plenty of horrific pictures like this around the world, um, what we're talking about is not really an island either. Um, and in fact, it's not even really a soup. Um, Despite, even though there are, you know, terrible scenes like this and there are wildlife being um, uh, hindered all around the world, uh, soup isn't quite accurate either. Uh, the best way to think of this problem is uh, as a plastic smog. This is actually a computer model representing uh, where the plastic has been accumulating over uh, decades of um, pollution. Uh, based on the work of five gyres, we now know that it's come, that it amounts to 270,000 metric tons. This is our first estimate that came out in late December four, 2014, and that's comprised from 5.25 trillion pieces. Um, this is just an, an enormous problem in a very short period of time. Um, you know, less than 100 years, we have um, completely covered our oceans in plastic, what, um, including uh, finding plastic, debris, and particles and fibers in the 
Arctic and Antarctic regions. So how did they arrive at these numbers? Well, they used a little device called uh, a trawl. And uh, here it is, not really in, in action. It's more just sort of dumped over the side of the boat. When, uh, when it's in action, um, you know, the boat's moving a little bit faster. But this will give you an idea. Uh, <clears throat> a trawl comprises of, uh, most importantly, a net, uh, some type of floating device, usually, although sometimes we find that weights are, are the better uh, thing to apply. And then an opening and hardware to connect everything and, and pull it along. So it's not that complicated. Um, the, one of the challenges with this issue is that the material sits um, just below the surface. Here's where uh, five gyres went to establish those, uh, that 270,000 metric tons. You can see they, they went all over the world. The, the name of their organization comes from the five largest swirling currents, referred to as a gyre. So the five biggest gyres in the world are in the North and South Pacific, the North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And you can see in each of the gyres, they found small, medium, large, and extra large pieces of plastic in very large quantities. Here's what they found. Um, where, where I am in New York City, uh, this was in um, the Hudson River. Um, you can see the, the, the trawl in action at that point being pulled along. And here are the particles that they found in June 2015. How did we get here? Well, we have increased exponentially the amount of plastic production, uh, primarily after World War II. So we have seen and a skyrocketing growth in the production of plastic in, in the last 50 years, and yet we see actually very, very little being recycled. Uh, this uh, graphic comes from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They've done excellent work on the, um, pushing for a circular economy, and you can see very clearly that out of the massive amount of plastic production, only 2% is getting uh, closed loop recycling um, of the 14% that is collected. So we have this massive amount being generated, only 14% gets collected. You lose some for process losses, some gets downcycled, and only a very small percentage gets closed loop recycling. We need to change that into a much um, more robust circular uh, economy. As we talk about this issue, it's uh, helpful to think of this analogy. If you saw this scene in your kitchen, you walked into your kitchen and you saw the water pouring out of the sink, your first response would not be to grab a mop. It would be to shut the water off at its source. And we need to think of the plastic pollution problem this way. We've, we've seen a lot of interesting um, solutions attempting to clean uh, our oceans. Uh, but it's helpful to think back to this analogy whenever we, we encounter those because the plastic is entering the ocean at a garbage truck a minute. Eight million tons are added annually, uh, according to the United Nations Environment Program. So until we go and shut off the tap, until we cut off the source of the plastic, any efforts to, to uh, clean our oceans are going to be misguided and um, missing a, an, an opportunity to, um, to really uh, target the problem. So how does this project uh, attempt to do that? Well, I'll give you a little, little background. It began when we uh, started collaborating with Five Gyres. I knew them from uh, my work uh, at Sustainable Works in Santa Monica and I wanted to uh, assist them with uh, my design background. And so. In conversations with them, one of the things they mentioned is that they were getting calls from all over the world asking for the trawl. They wanted um, people, academic institutions, scientists, citizen scientists were contacting them saying, um, can you send us a trawl? Can you tell us how to build a trawl? And so the project began by just doing some dimension drawings. Um, uh, this was actually before Fusion was around. Um, and uh, did these drawings for them and this started uh, the collaboration. Um, we, we began to realize that this could be a really helpful way 
to help disseminate the, uh, the data collection. So when the opportunity arose to uh, participate in something called a design swarm, and maybe some of you have, have done this, uh, it's kind of like a hackathon meets design thinking. Well, uh, the International uh, Design Society of America, IDSA, had a national, international conference and they were going to do a design swarm and uh, was chosen to, to participate. It was a form of a competition where each group would uh, spend three hours generating different ideas and then you would present your idea in a very short time frame. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I, I want to do something um, like what the new school did for the solar decathlon. I was really inspired when I first started uh, uh, teaching at the new school by the solar decathlon, which maybe some of you are familiar with. It's an excellent project, and maybe even some of you participated in it, um, where universities around the world build a house that is solar powered, and they live in it for a week and uh, demonstrate um, the possibilities of a solar powered home. Uh, what was great about the new school's entry is they thought not only about the competition, but how to build something that would actually last. So while there are all these great homes that get built uh, for the competition, they often end up sitting uh, in a parking lot somewhere back on campus. And the new school's project is now providing a, a home for a family outside of Washington, D.C. So I was really inspired by that. And I thought, okay, if we're going to do this design swarm, let me bring a project that can hopefully have some lasting value. Uh, so we brought them the, the idea of, um, well, we brought them the idea that became testing our, our waters. We participated in the design swarm, and, uh, and over the next three hours, we kind of created this idea of a project that would make it easy for citizen scientists to data collect plastic pollution. Uh, we won the competition and, and, were, and presented in front of the um, IDSA uh, uh, national conference um, uh, during that time. So you, you, we went from a little workshop on the side of the conference to then presenting in front of everybody. We partnered with Five Gyres who have done uh, really pioneering work in this uh, field. They're the ones who created that trawl that I showed earlier. And the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper have been uh, critical uh, partners in, in testing our various trawls and getting us out on the water to um, find out how successful or, or not successful our different new designs are. We have received grants from the New Schools, Tishman Environment and Design Center, and Autodesk Foundation have both been very generous in, in getting this project um, uh, off the ground. It enabled us to bring on some great research assistance. China is an environmental policy graduate student in Ashwarya as a product designer. It's really instrumental. What was great is most recently in Charleston, South Carolina, there was a conference called Breaking Down Plastic. And we were invited to participate there and um, speak and, and trawl. But what was um, really inspiring is that they became sort of the first uh, proof of concept where after they let us uh, uh, contacted us and said they were interested in building one of our trawls. We sent them dimension drawings of one of the most uh, uh, recent designs that we had come up with. They took those drawings. They had access to a welder at their uh, the, uh, the South Carolina Aquarium was the organizer of the conference, and on their site they had a welder. So they we sent them drawings for a trawl that um, if you had access to a welder, this would be a good one to use. They um, took the drawings, they built the trawl, and um, you can see the results. It was uh, uh, successfully uh, testing their uh, waterways for plastic. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is that, unfortunately um, and predictably, they, they found plastic. So when you step into our, our site, testingourwaters.net, one of the things that we're, uh, we're building out, and, and it's really kind of a soft launch. We haven't, uh, we're, we're still in the process of, of building it, but one of the things that we uh, think will be very helpful for people to, to get started is to, to look at the trawl matrix that we have created and identify uh, various trawls that we have built or uh, linked to and list them by price, by number of components, 
by our estimated build difficulty, and then what type of environment it is best suited for. Um, and then whether or not we've seen uh, uh, success or failure at these different uh, environments. So some trawls are successful in all environments. Some trawls work really well off a, off a bridge, um, but don't work well uh, in a water environment. So this is, a uh, we hope, a, a handy way to uh, decide where you're going to be trawling. You, you want to think about, you know, is it a boat or open water? Um, do I, can I do it easily off a bridge or can I walk a shoreline? Um, and then decide on how much money you're willing to spend on something like this and um, decide how uh, challenging you are, um, uh, what type of challenge you're up for in, in building the trawl. So one of the first ones that um, we created was a hardware trawl designed by uh, Marcus Erickson, um, and it's made from $40 in hardware store parts. There's an air conditioning um, uh, duct, uh, a paint filter for a five-gallon bucket, and then just a large plank uh, of wood. So it works as a bridge trawl, but as you can see in the bottom picture, for a boat trawl, it doesn't stay up above the, the surface the way we want it to. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the plastic uh, often sits right on the surface. So uh, pulling this trawl, uh, you want to, if you're pulling a trawl on a boat, you want to make sure that it's capturing everything that's going over the surface uh, of the water. So here's another design that we had uh, called a, a buoy trawl. This one, um, is a realization of a concept that came from the design swarm. Um, and the idea was that it could be initially 3D printed and then uh, mass produced. Uh, we created the section, if you were to cr uh, look at a section of this, kind of like a, an airfoil uh, for an airplane wing. And that actually created problems. As, as you'll see, it, uh, um, it kind of oscillates in the water. Uh, this isn't a movie, it's just an animated GIF, so it's a little choppy, but uh, um, it, instead of staying smooth on the water like we want it to, we kind of overcompensated, and that, that airfoil shape caused the trawl to want to dive down into the water, and then it jumps back up out of the water when the slack on the tow rope um, uh, finally is forced to, to pull it up out of the water. So it's kind of like a, a little dolphin action there that... Um, well, kind of fun to watch for a little bit doesn't provide us the, the data that we're that we're looking for. So we we, we started um, simplifying things. This is a picture of the Gowanus Canal in in Brooklyn, um, and we said, well, let's just make it really simple. And uh, we know that there are a lot of people that will have access to a bridge, and let's just test the uh, pollution that's uh, moving in and out of the canal. And so this is a, a really simple trawl, just the, the, the rim from a five-gallon bucket uh, with a hose clamp holding it on. You could use probably a rubber band and some type of weight. I mentioned that, you know, not, you don't always need a float. Sometimes you need a weight. In this instance, a weight is really helpful to keep the orientation of the, the opening um, uh, facing the, the incoming plastic. We have a course that we have been developing these ideas. Uh, even further, one of the first things we did in the course was um, assign the students to design a trawl from IKEA parts. IKEA is globally accessible, um, usually very inexpensive, and we thought, you know, there might be something that they can find at IKEA that could work really well as a trawl. And uh, in fact, uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, this is called the, the frog trawl. Um, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, very similar to the bridge trawl. This one doesn't need any tools at all, just binder clips, rope, and, and some form of a weight. Um, Rob helped us uh, with uh, putting together uh, a, a blog post um, that you can find on the Engineering for Change website uh, as well. So it's a really easy way to, to get trawling. We have Instructables uh, pages, um, and we're going to be fleshing these out more and more. Um, we have to catch up a little bit with some of our latest developments, but right now uh, um, there are four different uh, trawls up there. Um, the three I showed plus one that uh, the students called a, a trawl uh which is 
using a, um, a tambourine as the opening for, for a trawl. So we continued to develop different uh, concepts. The, the buoy trawl became the, the ray trawl. We wanted the water to, we wanted the trawl to stay right on the surface of the water. And so this is a, a concept that we see developing into a mass produced um, item. And we're really pleased with the way this works. Um, hopefully you can see that animation now, uh, the movie capturing just how steady this trawl was at staying on the surface of uh, the water. So uh, we'll be continuing to develop this concept. But we were um, also, uh, when, the last time we went out on the water, the challenge here in New York City is that we, or one of many challenges, is that um, we can't go trawling uh, 12 months out of the year. So one of the last times that we had to go trawling last fall, uh, we said, well, let's, let's capture, you know, some of the other ideas that we've had for various trawls. And um, at the last moment, we decided let's weld together um, that concept of uh, creating a, a really simple frame and using the disposable bottles, the, uh, the problem, you know, disposables is a big source of the plastic pollution. So let's use the problem to help with the solution and let's use those um, as flotation devices. Plastic. Um, as a as a material is wonderful. It's uh, inexpensive, cheap, and it has incredible durability. Um, but when you use it for a disposable item, that's when it becomes a problem. So we built this trawl, welded together the frame, and then attached. Uh, in this case, like a uh, a big uh, jug on the on the on the sides, and we're really pleased with how well this trawl stayed on the surface. Uh, as well, and so this is the trawl uh, drawings, uh, or drawings of this trawl is what we sent to South Carolina Aquarium and got their, um, uh, got them up and, and testing uh, right away. Here's the workshop that we, uh, we did uh, last month. We used just a water taxi and had five trawls coming off of that. You can see them on the picture on the right. Uh, a number of different trawls, and I'll I'll go into the most recent one. So we were excited to get back on the water. We couldn't do it here in New York, but uh, by going to that conference in South Carolina, we were able to test um, our latest trawl, which was taking that recycled trawl and simplifying it even more. We know that there are a lot of schools and academic institutions that have access to 3D printers, so this might not be something that uh, somebody can do in their home, but an organization could do this um, uh, easily with a 3D printer. So instead of a welded frame, um, the frame consists of two 3D printed uh, parts, which uh, are on either side of the opening. The filament for the 3D part is made from recycled bottles. So the 3D part is uh, made from recycled bottles, and then we're using, like the recycled trawl earlier, we're using disposable uh, beverage containers as the flotation device. And we're really pleased with how uh, light and portable and compact this trawl folds up, and you can unscrew the bottles, um, and the whole thing gets really small, but then, uh, as you can see, works, uh, works really well. The total material cost, is less than $15. So you do need access to a 3D printer, but um, at this point there are a number of schools that, that have them, and so uh, we're looking to distribute them uh, as, as soon as we make a few uh, adjustments to the, the 3D file. So once you gather the uh, material, you're going to want to process it. So you, you, every time we've gone, we've found plastic. Um, how you then process it is important. So uh, we're still building this part of our website out. Uh, we just put uh, some additions on this week. There'll be more next week. There'll be more in the, the coming weeks as we close out the, 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 the semester. Um, so if you go to the site, it's just constantly evolving and changing. Uh, but you'll see something like this under processing um, where you can go and look at the image, and look at what you need, and then scroll down and like uh, the blog posts uh, on engineering for change, kind of like walk you through the instructions of, of how to process it. First, you want to turn the net inside out. You want to let the sample dry. 
uh, and then you want to use uh, tweezers to meticulously pick the, the organic from the inorganic material. Um, take a look at it against a five millimeter net and then uh, post the, what you found, a picture of what you found. We're going to be collecting that on um, our pollution page. So uh, I showed you images of us trawling on the Gowanus Canal. Here's, here's one of those expeditions, what we found. In, in the Gowanus, and this is after just uh, 15 minutes of, of trawling. This is, a, this is the amount of uh, uh, pollution that we were uh, collecting. Designing your own trawl is really simple. Um, hopefully you kind of see that the, the key components are you got to have a net. We're using a five-gallon paint bucket filter. They, you buy, they're sold for about $2. You buy them in bulk, you can get it for about $1.50. You can use it um, a couple of times, but they do rip much more easily than we would like. Um, and so we're collecting them and then uh, processing them and then uh, recycling them. But it's an inexpensive way to find out how polluted your uh, area uh, likely is. Uh, you need some type of frame to hold the net open. You can't just put the net in the water. You have to have something that holds it open, uh, so some type of frame. Then either floats the weight to keep the opening in the net on the surface of the water. Uh, the plastic that we're finding is the plastic that floats. A lot of the plastic that's polluting our ocean sinks, and we'll probably never get to that material. But we can use the floating plastic as a barometer for the uh, pollution problem and to find out where is the pollution coming from. So, you know, underneath all of this um, project is how can we crowdsource the data collection and identify where the source of the pollution is coming from. Um, the, the next uh, uh, essentials in a trawl, you got to have something to pull it, and then there are connector pieces to, to hold either the net onto the frame um, or uh, the rope onto um, uh, the, the frame. So you need some type of, some type of hardware. We have a template um, uh, that you can manipulate. Uh, we're just trying to make it easy to show, uh, get people uh, understanding that it's really easy to get started in doing this, uh, send us drawings, we can help design uh, the trawls along with you. Um, if you have a design that you want to share, we would love that too. Uh, we're seeing the project as uh, being an aggregator and collector of all kinds of uh, interesting ideas for um, citizen science to get trawling and to find out, you know, just how bad the plastic pollution is in their area. Uh, next steps. Uh, for us in, include uh, integrating some app to, to show where you were when you found that plastic. Uh, we're testing these various apps, um, whether it's Clean Swell or uh, Literati is a great one. It's not really for marine uh, pollution, but we really like the, the visuals and the community that they're, that they're building around that. There's a great TED Talk. Um, from uh, Jeff Kushner, the founder of Literati, that just came out um, this spring. Uh, Marine Debris Tracker was one of the earliest apps to, if not the first, to, to really address this issue. And importantly, um, they have recently uh, added the ability to track over distances, which is important for our trawling app. We, we're, um, the Clean Swell of Literati and the South Carolina Aquarium will show you uh, where you're picking up a piece of trash, but for our purposes, we need something that can track from point A to point B, and then we can evaluate how much trash we found in getting from A to B um, and, and make some assessments as to how polluted the waters are that way. So instead of just picking up the piece of trash at one location, we need it to be able to track over uh, distances, and um, we're working with uh, Marine Debris Tracker to get that. Um, and get our project uh, set up. Actually, we want to be, uh, you know, once you find out how polluted it is, we want to be pushing for policy change. Um, there's a great uh, example by Five Gyres 
you know, they were putting out uh, information like uh, the graphic in the background talking about how much micro, how many microbeads were being produced. And it's an inspiring story because they went from finding microbeads um, in their trawls around the Great Lakes to three years later getting President Obama to sign a microbead ban. So um, it was uh, inspiring to see that they took the, the science and, and made uh, policy change um, in a relatively short, short period of time. Um, next steps for us, we're going we're gonna to have a more promoted launch. Like I said, this is kind of a soft launch. We're still refining the website. Here's kind of a peek behind the curtain into our, um, our, our web space, uh, our website um, architecture. We're looking to make it really clear how you would uh, build your own trawl designs and fleshing out the uh, instructions uh, on our website and on the Instructables uh, page. Um, closing uh, thoughts, I hope that you all feel um, that you can get started, uh, that you can go out and try trawling wherever you have access to water, whether it's walking along the shore, dangling it over a bridge, or, or pulling it behind a boat. Um, last week I tested the, um, the trawl we're calling the RE3DP, the Recycled 3D Printed Trawl. Um, I tested the RE3DP trawl behind a, a pedal boat, um, or sometimes they're called a, a paddle boat, those boats that you just kind of leisurely cruise around um, a, a lake. And that trawl worked well, uh, even on a slow-moving boat like that. So uh, I hope at the end of this you feel um, that it's something that you can get started and, and doing. Um, we would love feedback on the trawl matrix. We, we hope that uh, that is a helpful tool in um, selecting what kind of trawl you want to, to build and, and to begin trawling, or uh, that you understand that this is something that you can design on, on your own, that um, you just need uh, a net, a frame to hold it open, floats or weights, um, something to pull it, and connections. And um, you can uh, start testing um, the pollution levels in, in your area. So. Um, We'd love to uh, see folks get, in, get involved. Uh, I want to leave time for um, uh, questions. So uh, if any of you uh, have them, I'd love to uh, take the, the, the time that we have remaining uh, for Q&A. Thank you, Baron. That was uh, very interesting um, and a great presentation. I love the, um, the videos and all the photos. Um, there are a couple of questions that have uh, come in for you um, from um, one of the participants. And if anyone else who's participating right now would like to ask questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A field. It's um, right under the chat field. Um, the first question, Baron, is if there are any large ships that are trawling. Um, the largest trawls that are happening are the, like the ones that um, uh, I showed early in the presentation, like the Manta trawl. So that's a, a very current, um, a trawl that's been, they've made several versions of that. Um, they're usually uh, all connected to some type of NGO, some type of uh, nonprofit organization like Five Gyres. Um, and they're, um, specifically going out and, and doing it for that research uh, effort. Uh, it doesn't mean that that couldn't happen in the future, that, you know, uh, boats that are, you know, commuting essentially could also uh, begin doing this. And that would be a great way to, to get uh, more, more feedback. Um, it would take some uh, relationship building, but uh, it's certainly something that could happen in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is about um, w uh, where to, the, the, the person is asking um, if the, the slides that you showed will be available uh, so, so they can see how to build the trawls. Um, but um, 
uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in and say that uh, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on our site and on YouTube. Um, but I imagine um, you, Baron, have a good answer to that. Um, I'm sure these are available on your on your website. Yeah, yeah. You can go to testingourwaters.net. Uh, you know, because we're essentially towing a net through the water. So testingourwaters.net, um, and uh, you can see, you can find the various trawls, and we're, you saw the instructable page that we're building uh, out. Um, we have some of our early trawls on there, and we'll be adding the uh, most recent trawls uh, as well to that page. So it's constantly evolving and, and changing. So um, you know, keep coming back and, and looking for um, mm -hmm. latest developments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, um, have you uh, thought about or seen any kind of negative effect on marine life from, from the trolls? Um, occasionally, sadly, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, a jellyfish or, or something uh, in there, but uh, what's helpful is that uh, you're on a boat and so the, the fish uh, will generally move out of the way of the boat and uh, the plastic doesn't, and so you can you can collect uh, the pollution without having you know really detrimental uh, effects on on the aquatic life. They they move out of the way when they hear or, or see or feel the the boat coming, and the plastic just sits and floats on the surface, and you can collect it. Mm -hmm. um, and another question is: Have you seen any major differences in the types and and the size of plastic in different areas around the world, um, maybe based on currents, or, or has it been fairly uniform? No, the currents play a big part. Um, when you have access to the slides and uh, in the presentation, you can go back to that plastic smog uh, image. That's from Five Gyres. Um, you can go to their site and, and, and find more. But yeah, what's happening is that the uh, plastic is uh, accumulating where the ocean currents swirl. And so uh, it, gets, it gets polluted into the ocean, gets brought out and broken up into sea, not degrading, but just broken from a big piece of plastic into a smaller uh, piece of plastic. But it's still plastic and it's being uh, ingested and it's working uh, its way up uh, the food chain. So plastic serves as a, as a sponge for a lot of uh, nasty uh, toxic um, materials and so unfortunately when fish ingest it which of course happens um, it it then becomes part of uh, our food chain if we're um, a, you know eating eating fish so it's something that um, the the plastic is always pooling in those currents most recently last uh, week I think there was an article um, that talked about how the plastic, uh, after kind of swirling around in various currents, is then being kind of dumped into the poles, into the, the Arctic area. So now they're seeing plastic from, you know, nowhere near uh, where they're finding it in the Arctic Circle. Um, they're finding plastic accumulating there. So the hypothesis is that it's, it's being, um, Sort of swirling around and then dumped into uh, the the north or south pole where they're finding it accumulate um, where there's you know there's no source anywhere near um, uh, where it could have uh, been coming from. So they they're hypothesizing that the plastic is actually being dumped from those five gyres into the poles. Question um, uh, about your work. Yeah. Um, the, the, this person would like to know, um, th this person says that, that, that they were expecting uh, more of a focus on uh, reducing the pollution problem instead of um, hearing about measuring it. And you addressed um, why it's important to measure it um, in the beginning of your presentation. And I'm sure you, um, when you're explaining your work to people, this is one of the things that that um, people might ask about. What do you What do you say when when people ask you about reducing it instead of measuring it? Well, we're measuring it in order to be able to cut it off at its source. 
um, you know, efforts to, uh, to, to clean it um, are, you know, it's, are, are, are just going to be exercises in futility at this point because it's entering at such a huge and rapid rate. You know, it's a garbage truck uh, a minute or 8 million tons annually. So we've, we've got to cut off the use of disposables. We've got to prevent it from entering our waterways in the storm drain system. So, you know, big picture, we need to dispose of disposables. You know, this, uh, the, the, the convenience factor uh, gave us a, a short-term benefit, but now we're seeing the long-term repercussions of that disposable mentality, that disposable society. So we need to move away entirely from uh, disposables, uh, which is sort of a linear uh, thinking uh, approach, and move to a circular uh, economy approach because we, uh, we've got one planet and you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. We, we've done it for a short period of time, but now we're seeing the feedback. So uh, our project tries to make visible the plastic that's already out there because since you can't see it, you can look out over the water and, and see this beautiful uh, uh, blue-green um, uh, ocean and think that, you know, it's a, a healthy ecosystem. And in reality, whether it's the ocean or the rivers or the lake, there's plastic sitting just beneath the surface that has been building there. So we're trying to illuminate that problem and then hopefully use, once the project is, is up and running full force, use the ability to crowdsource the data collection to identify where is it coming from, where is the plastic entering our oceans and, uh, and prevent those um, uh, symbolic, you know, the, the analogy to the dump trucks. We've got to prevent those dump trucks from, from entering. Or uh, back to the analogy in my presentation, we have to turn off the faucet. We have to shut off the tap. Yeah, I thought that uh, one dump truck every minute was a powerful image. It's a, it's a powerful way to express that number. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I get it. It's you know, it's like, oh, we have a mess. Let's clean it up. But we have to understand um, the rate at which the plastic is entering our ocean. We're not going to be able to keep up. Um, we need to uh, we need to to cut it off at its source. Right. Um, another question, and I'm also just going to um, tack on one of my own to this. Um, what um, what activities are you involved in um, trying to to persuade people to um, take part and, and do this trawling themselves? I guess that's besides present an E4C webinar. And um, my own question is, um, how has that been going so far? How, about um, how much participation do you have and, and what's your goal? Yeah, that's uh, that's really kind of the next phase is is to have a, a promoted uh, launch. We have, uh, as you know, Five Jars is one of our partners, and we um, have connected with their uh, ambassador here in New York. They have global um, ambassadors, and so we're going to arrange different uh, events that will allow um, interested uh, public citizen scientists to, to engage. So well, that's kind of the, the next step once we kind of um, uh, fine tune our, our website is we'll have an event, um, you know, also right now we can't get on the water. Nobody's, nobody's out on the water just yet, although we do have some warm days. Um, once the, the weather breaks here in New York, we're going to be having uh, different events um, and we'll promote those uh, on our new Facebook page, but we'll also share with our with our partners who have a more established uh, following um, with uh, New York, New Jersey Baykeeper and, and Five Gyres to help us um, tap into their uh, engaged uh, citizens to uh, show them that, that, you know, this is a way for you to get involved. Okay, great. Um, another question is whether uh, this type of equipment, if you ever consider whether it could be sold to volunteer organizations to get, to help get them involved. Yeah, um, you know we saw the uh, eventually what we're going to be doing is is uh, having those uh, 
like the, the re 3D pre-trawl, the one that's from recycled materials, we'll have that as a downloadable file and we'll have a link to how you can order all of the, the, the rope and the nets and the, and the hardware. So it'll be really easy for you to just um, click and, and, um, and, and build these uh, components yourself. We also are going to be establishing a, uh, a presence on Public Lab, which is a, a great uh, citizen science uh, portal for all kinds of projects like ours. So Public Lab is sort of an aggregator of, of um, environmental um, citizen science data collection projects. And um, one of the uh, members of Public Lab, I teach a sustainable systems class with. And so we've, we, you know, we, we made the connection uh, recently on a boat um, for the class and, and realized, hey, this is a, it's a great fit. So, um, they'll sell, eventually we'll have a kit available so you can just order uh, a trawl and make it that much easier um, for, say, a nonprofit or a school to just uh, get started. But um, that'll be uh, on the intermediate future. In the short term, uh, we'll have the, the file and uh, links to where you can order the parts yourself um, uh, up uh, available shortly so you can um, build this on your own and, and get testing right away. Great. Um, I, I have another question for you, if you don't mind. Um, I, I was wondering if, um, just based on the data that you've collected so far, uh, are you, is, is there enough um, right now that, that you're, you're able to see any kind of trend in um, the type of plastic or the, or the source um, to, to be able to, to make any statements about where it might be coming from? or? Not yet. No, uh, we'd love to to do that, but it, you know we don't have enough data to data yet to to be able to make those determinations. Eventually, we will. Um, you know, right now we're we're still kind of uh, testing the trawls and you know making sure they they collect the material, and do it easily, and you know get as inexpensive as possible uh, for you know anyone that wants to do it, whether it's an individual or a group. So once we get all those kinks out, then we'll start to be able to develop some some um, some trends and then, you know, uh, identify where, where the sources are. Um, one of the things that's kind of uh, interesting on, on that issue is that when they, um, when they started trawling globally, they had some, some estimates in mind. And when, when they came out with that number, it was actually lower than what they thought it would be. And so, so even though that number is so huge, it was actually smaller than what they thought it would be and they are the hypothesis is that it's being ingested. Um, so uh, there are some particle sizes of plastic that match up with um, organisms on the food chain really closely, and they were missing that size. And the um, uh, thinking is that you know fish were eating that size plastic. Um, thinking it was a um, uh, a meal, and uh, and so as as part of the study, um, they think that might be why the, the numbers might be a little bit lower because um, the ingestion of plastic into these materials. It's become routine now. Um, not just uh, uh, you know we've seen the work from Chris Jordan and the, the atrocity going on at the Midway Atoll with the Laysan albatross because they, the way they feed is almost identical mm -hmm. to the way a trawl collects the floating plastic. So they're, they're scooping up, hoping to get fish, and they're scooping up plastic and then killing their, their young and ingesting it when they regurgitate the food into their mouth. So you've seen that, but now it's also become routine to see whales and other large sea creatures that, you know, are ingesting such massive amounts of, of plastic that they perish uh, because of the the pollution in their the plastic pollution in their uh, digestive system, so sadly we're going to see more and more of that. Wow, uh, that's sad. Is there anything you can say on a last note to uh, pick up our spirits? Well, it, we created this problem, so it's not inevitable, you know, uh, which means that we can also solve it. Um, 
and uh, the the issue is is you know sometimes we see these we see these numbers and we're like oh well, you know we shrug our you know sometimes the response might be to to shrug your shoulders and in, in despair but it it's helpful to remember that if we created this problem then we can solve it we can design circular economy uh, business models we can get rid of the notion of disposable uh, packaging which isn't really disposable it just you know creates a problem somewhere else so um, knowing that this problem is not um, something you know uh, inevitable that we have to live with but something that uh, we can solve I think is um, uh, helpful in, in, in addressing it but um, if you, we don't know it exists then we're not gonna we're not gonna do anything and so um, our efforts are um, partly to, to illuminate the, the issue of this pollution that's sitting just beneath the surface um, to hopefully motivate more and more people to, to do something positive to, to fight it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thanks again for um, taking the time to present your work. Um, it's, been, it's been very interesting. And I hope that the people listening take the time to check out your site, um, maybe get involved with trawling yourselves. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, if you're after a professional development hour, uh, you can see the code on the screen right here. And if you have questions, please email us at the email address on the screen. And don't forget to become an E4C member, and we'll send you more information on our upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.